When the judgment was complete, I looked around at the faces of the saints. Such happiness, such perfect peace. An angel led me to a river pure and clean, flowing from the throne of God. It wound through the middle of the street of the city and fed the tree of life. There will be no more curse, no more death, no more night. They will be his people, and he will be their God. He spoke to me as the vision began to fade. Let the evildoers still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right and the holy still be holy. The spirit and the bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my judgment with me to repay everyone for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Well, there's a sample of the dramas we're offering to you free all this month. Welcome to Back to the Bible. Hi, I'm Woodrow Kroll, along with Tammy Weisert. We have some of our dear friends in the studio again today. I'm glad you're here because today, hey, Tammy, this is the day we've waited for for months. Today is the day we wrap up our personal Bible study in the book of Revelation. Now, we've been doing this for the past eight weeks, and today uh, we're going to look at the final message of the Bible and kind of give an overview of what this book is about But the final message of the Bible is an invitation to salvation, and I think that's the major feature of the book of Revelation. After all, this is not the revelation of John. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ to John. The book of Revelation is not designed simply to fill in details about the future that we don't know. It's not designed for speculation. It's designed to show that God knows where he's going, that God has a plan, He has an ending plan. He has an exit strategy as well as a beginning strategy. And that plan relates to his son, Jesus. Dr. Kroll, if you could sum up the book of Revelation in just one final thought, if that's possible, (laughs) Mm -hmm. how would you do that? What would you say is the greatest thing that we can take away from the study of this book of Revelation? Uh, I think that there's good news in the midst of bad news. Uh, There's a lot of bad news out there today. Uh, We all agree to that. And when you read the book of Revelation, there's a lot of bad news in the future, too. But at the end of the book, after all the bad news, God ends this book with significantly good news. Uh, We've come now to Revelation chapter 22, which is the final chapter of the Bible, the final chapter of this book. Now remember, with Revelation chapter 22, the Apostle John completes his responsibility that was given to him by God in the very first chapter. In chapter 1, verse 19, God told John, Write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. In other words, write past, present, and future. Now, I think that's the divine outline of the book of Revelation. There are things in the early chapters that are past. There are things in those chapters that John is writing to actual churches of his day. But when you get to chapter 4 and all the way to the end, everything is future. Now, John has accomplished his goal. He has written down the things that the Spirit of God has revealed to him as he was caught up into heaven. So when we get to chapter 22, look at verse 6. It says, Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Okay. John has been faithful in writing down the things that God has revealed to him that must shortly take place. Now we get to the end of the book. John has been faithful. He's done his duty. He's written it all down. He doesn't understand it all, and neither do we. But God doesn't promise us a blessing for understanding. He promises a blessing to those who read the book and who obey it. Now just think with me where this guy John has been. 
He's a banished apostle on the island of Patmos. He's in prison for preaching the gospel. And while he's banished to this island, God comes to him in a most unique way and gives him a vision of future things. He doesn't understand them all, but he writes them down. So he sees a seven-sealed scroll. And he weeps because there's no one who's able to open this scroll and reveal its contents. And then the Lion of the tribe of Judah steps forward. That's Jesus. And only Jesus is worthy to open this scroll. So Jesus breaks the first seal and unrolls the scroll a little bit. That first seal is a judgment that God is bringing on the earth. He's always promised judgment. He's just withheld it for all these generations because we've been living in the day of his grace. But now, Revelation is recording the day of his judgment. So the scroll was opened, the seal was broken, and he sees the first judgment. Then he breaks another seal further into the scroll. And he rolls it a little further, and he knows a second judgment. He breaks six seals. There are seven total. When he breaks the seventh seal, that seventh seal reveals seven brand new judgments. They come springing out of that seventh seal, and they are the trumpet judgments. So now he's seen seven judgments of God described as seals. He's seen seven judgments of God described as trumpets, the call of God to judgment. And then later on in the book, he saw seven judgments of God as goblets or bowls or vials, and they simply pour out the judgment of God upon the earth. John has seen seven years of absolutely horrible tribulation on this earth. The sun has become black. The moon has turned red. The water systems and the streams are all filled with blood. The the earth is scorched. It's just horrendous, horrendous time. And during this time, there is going to be a person who will rise to the task and say, I can lead this world. And he will be absolutely opposed to Christ. That's why we call him the Antichrist. He will be the tool of Satan to bring about what Satan thinks is going to be his chance to have a kingdom on this earth. Now, he'll be a failure, of course, but he doesn't know that. He has a friend who's a a false prophet who gets people to worship the Antichrist. The Antichrist worships Satan. During this whole time, John is going to see literally multitudes of people slain. Many, many people die. That's a tough thing. He's going to see the one world church be formed and a whole ecclesiastical unit be formed in Rome. And then he's going to see the Antichrist use it to gain power. And when the Antichrist doesn't need it anymore, he's going to see the Antichrist just trash it, just throw it away. And the political arena, he's going to see this common market of nations in Europe who have banded together and are fueling the cause of the Antichrist. He's going to see God destroy that. Just imagine what John has seen over the course of just a short period of time. Finally, when you get to chapter 19, John sees Jesus Christ riding out of heaven. He's clothed in white. There's blood on his robe. He's riding a white horse. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, everything John sees is absolutely amazing. He now sees Christ as the king of the earth. He now sees the end of time. He sees a thousand years in which Jesus reigns upon this earth. And then at the end of that thousand years, he sees Satan being loosed out of the bottomless pit to lead one last rebellion against God. And that rebellion is put down. John then is overawed by what he sees at the very end of the book. He's just overawed by what he's witnessed, overawed by what he's heard, overawed by what he's seen. And the only thing he can do is worship. He falls before God in worship. Now, I want you to look with me just before we get to chapter 22. I want you to look with me at chapter 21, verse 10 again. It says, He, that's a, an angel, carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, showed me the great city, the holy city, descending out of heaven from God. John sees this great city, and John is commanded to reveal everything we know about the holy city of God, and he does so. Now we get to Revelation chapter 22 at verse 10, and notice what it says here. He says to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Isn't this interesting? About the first thing John sees is a scroll that's sealed and no one to break the seals. 
Now he gets to the end of his revelation and God tells him, don't seal the prophecy of this book. I want everybody to know what's in this book. Should you be reading the book of Revelation? Well, I'll tell you what, if you want truth, read Revelation. You want fiction, read the Da Vinci Code. You want to know the truth, read what God said. And that's why we should be reading the book of Revelation, because God doesn't want it sealed. God doesn't want this to be a secret to us. God wants us to understand what his program is going to look like in the future and how all this is going to work out. So how is it going to work out? Look at verse 11. He who is unjust, chapter 22 of Revelation, verse 11, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates of the city." Now, basically, what verses 11 through 15 are telling us here is that when Christ comes again, time stands still. When Christ comes again at his second coming, there will be no time then for us to fix all the things in our life that we're not proud of. That's going to be true at the rapture of the church, too. But here he's saying, when a person is just and I come, that person will be just for all eternity. I mean, forever. If a person is unjust when I come, that person will remain unjust for all eternity forever. If a person is holy when I come, they will be holy. If they're unholy, they will be unholy still. That means forever and ever. So the event of the return of the Lord Jesus is the most single and singular event of the future that impacts how we approach the future, how we enjoy the future. That's why Jesus can say in verse 13, I am Alpha and Omega. I am the beginning and the end. I am the bookends of history. I am the first. I am the last. Verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. I am the bright and the morning star. Now, I think it's significant that Jesus uses so many descriptors here of himself. He's talking about who he is and why he has the right to be the first and the last. And isn't it interesting? Did you notice in verse 16, he said, I wanted you to write these things to the churches? You know what's important about that? In the book of Revelation, if you were with us in our study back in chapters 2 and 3, you know that the word church or churches occurs again and again and again. The early part of Revelation, all about the church. But from chapter 4, all the way until this verse, chapter 22, verse 16, the word church or churches is never mentioned, not once. There's a reason for that. Revelation 4 and following is all about the tribulation period. The reason the church isn't mentioned is we aren't here. This is all about Israel. This is all about God turning his attention to his people again during the time of their greatest tribulation. But now, when you get to eternity, hey, we're back in view. Now you can talk about the church again because the church is going to roll on forever. This is the final record of the mind of God to the minds of men. There are no other books of God, written by God, given by God to holy men who wrote them down, that we are missing that are not here. There are no addendums. In fact, it's kind of like a business meeting when you think about the Bible. There are no additions or corrections necessary. (laughs) This is the final message of God. Now, I want to come back in just a minute and look at God's final call, because the God of grace, even during the time of great tribulation and suffering, the God of grace is still calling people to come to him. The last thing you read in the Bible is the call of God to come to him. We'll be back in just a minute to look at that call.
You know what? Back to the Bible. We're all about great Bible teaching, and we have an exciting new CD for you that will bring revelation to life in a way that you've never experienced. The Time is Near, a dramatized interpretation of Revelation, is our brand new audio presentation of the events of Revelation. It's a 30-minute dramatic interpretation of the events that John recorded, and it'd be a great ad as you follow along with Dr. Kroll's series about the end times. We're offering The Time is Near free to you on CD, so call and ask for your very own free copy of this exciting drama today. Now, we have a CD ready and waiting for you, so call and ask for the free CD, The Time is Near. Get in touch with us at one 800 759 2425. That's 1-800-759-2425. Or you can always write to us at Back to the Bible, Box 82808, Lincoln, Nebraska, 68501. Again, that's Back to the Bible, Box 82808, Lincoln, Nebraska, 68501. Or log on to backtothebible.org. Now, when you get a hold of us, be sure to also ask for this month's free Meet with God called Preparing Our Hearts for the Future. It's a study in the book of Revelation. Now, let's go back to Wood. Well, you can feel the excitement now. We're in Revelation chapter 22. We've come to verse 17 to the final call of God in the Bible. And this is a serious call. He says in verse 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts come. And whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. This is God's final call to the world. The Holy Spirit says, Come on and join us. Uh, The bride of Christ says, come on and join us. Uh, God says, any of you who have thirsted spiritually, you come, and we will quench that thirst forever. Let him take of the water of life freely. This is the final call of God in the Bible. Now, someday, whoever you are, and it doesn't matter who we are, someday each of us is going to hear God's final call to us. That may come quicker for some of us than others, because death may be around the corner for some of us. But whenever the final call of God comes, it is the final call. There is a time in which God will say, this is the last opportunity you have to trust my Son as Savior. Because if you don't trust Him now, the opportunity stops and you will be unrighteous forever. Now that's scary. That's why it's important for us to take seriously the claims of the Bible with regard to salvation. God has a final call. Here it is. Come, join me now while there's still time. But adjacent to that final call, notice there's a final warning. Verse 18. For I testify that everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. Now, if you've been with us in this study... We're not talking about ten silly plagues in Egypt. We are talking about horrendous plagues occurring again and again. He says, if you add to this book, the book of Revelation, God will add those plagues to your future. And, verse 19, if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things that are written in this book. That's a stern warning. See, God expresses his grace. Come, join me now while there's time. And he expresses his warning. Don't wait. Because if you do wait, what awaits you is the most terrible fate possible. And you get down to the last two verses, verse 20 and 21. It says, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Now, in my Bible, those words, surely I am coming quickly, are in red. Maybe yours too, if you have a red letter edition. That means those are the words of Jesus. So the one who testifies to all these things. See, God's revealing them through his Spirit to John. And Jesus is standing there and saying, yep, yep, that's right, that's true, it's going to happen. 
It's exactly the way we planned it. Jesus says, getting his final word into you, I'm coming quickly. Don't delay about this. I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Can I say this to you as we close this eight-week series on the book of Revelation? The book of Revelation isn't designed to scare us. It's not designed to cause us to know who the Antichrist is or the common market nations, who they are. I mean, some people get so taken back by all these things. The book of Revelation is designed to show us that God means business. And when God said, look, if you sin against me, if you rebel against me, there are consequences for that sin. And just because you and I haven't seen those consequences doesn't mean they aren't coming. He's just withheld them because of his grace. The book of Revelation shows us God meant every word he said. And it will happen in his time and yet future, but it will happen. Now, the most amazing thing to me about God is, while it's happening, God is constantly saying to people on the earth, come to me. Let me put my arms of love around you. Just trust my son as Savior. Trust what he did at the cross to be what I require to pay for your sin, and I will accept you in my heaven. Not on what you do, but what he did for you. And here you get down to the very last verse of the Bible. Jesus says, Please do it, because I'm coming quickly. The book of Revelation, I think, is designed to help us know that God always keeps his word. And if he says there is trouble coming, if he says there is judgment coming, you can mark it down. It is coming. But if he says, you come to me today and I will keep you from that judgment, mark it down. God always keeps his word. Here at Back to the Bible, we would like nothing better that help you understand that when he says, come to me, you can do that right today. In just a minute, I'll return, and we'll wrap up our series on Revelation. More in a moment with Dr. Kroll here on Back to the Bible. Well, it's summer, and for a lot of people, it's a busy time with vacations and baseball games, trips to the swimming pool. And we realize you might not catch all of Dr. Kroll's messages in his series on Revelation. Well, we don't want you to miss any pieces of the puzzle to this tough book. So why don't you call us today and order Dr. Kroll's Revelation series on CD. That's all 40 messages for you to hear at your convenience. You'll get eight weeks worth of messages on 16 CDs for just 35 bucks. That is 17 hours worth of teaching time. And the great news is you'll have all the pieces to the Revelation puzzle in one place. And then you won't have to miss any of Dr. Kroll's teaching, no matter how busy your summer schedule is. So to order Dr. Kroll's entire Revelation series on CD, call us today at 1-800-759-2425. Again, that's 1-800-759-2425. Or you can write to us at Back to the Bible, Box 82808, Lincoln, Nebraska, 68501. That's Back to the Bible, Box 82808, Lincoln, Nebraska, 68501. And of course, our website is always open. It's backtothebible.org. Now, when you contact us, be sure to ask for this month's free Meet with God devotional. It's called The Future in God's Hands. It's a great short guide full of insights into the book of Revelation. Now, let's go back to Wood. Well, thank you for joining me for these weeks or as many days as you could of these weeks that we've been studying the book of Revelation. It's always a joy to have you as a part of our listening family. I appreciate it deeply. I know your pastor will appreciate you being in church this weekend, and uh, I would appreciate you coming back on Monday, listening again to Back to the Bible, participating with us. Remember, if you have a prayer request that you'd like to have us here at Back to the Bible pray for, a question you'd like to have answered, we have staff here that are more than willing to help you out on both accounts. We'd be delighted to hear from you. Thanks for being here today. God bless you. I'm Woodrow Kroll. Have a good and godly day. 